Hey guys, welcome back to School of Personal Finance. In this video, my dad's going to be talking about money things to do at the end of the year. And I'm stuck at home for 14 days because someone on my bus has been tested positive for COVID. And I'm really bored, so let's get to it. So here we are approaching the end of 2020 and the real question is are we going to survive the winter so i'm working from home my wife is working from home my three kids are on zoom calls throughout the day it is craziness but the show must go on so in this video i'm going to be talking about some tax planning and financial planning strategies that you should be thinking of as we approach the end of the year and i also have a free resource on my website schoolofpersonalfinance.com you could go there right on the home page you could click on it it is a checklist for things you should be thinking about as we approach the end of 2020. Going forward, I'm gonna to try to have a free resource each week on the homepage of my website that corresponds to the new video that I put out that week. And if you're watching this weeks after I put it out, I'm also gonna have an archive of all the resources that I've done in the past so you could go and you could find it at the schoolofpersonalfinance.com under the education and resources tab. All right, so I'm gonna talk about eight things that you should be thinking about going into the end of the year. And even before those eight things, one overall strategy that you should be thinking about every single year is that if you have a lower than normal income year for yourself, which might be 2020, if you got laid off, or you have reduced hours, what you should be doing is looking to accelerate income and defer deductions. So by accelerating income, you're in a low tax bracket. So an example of that would be to do a Roth conversion that would accelerate income into this year. And then deferring deductions, that would be not doing a traditional IRA contribution, instead doing a Roth IRA contribution. And on the flip side, if you're in a very high tax bracket, if you have a very good year and maybe you don't always have that much income then you want to look to do the exact opposite you want to look to defer income or put off income into the next year and accelerate deductions you want all the deductions you could get when you're in a high tax bracket they are more valuable during those years so some examples might be if you're self-employed you could have some business expenses towards the end of the year maybe you buy yourself a new macbook or maybe you need a new vehicle for your business those are ways that you could get more deductions and lower your income all right and now to the eight things and the first one is unique to 2020, and that is the CARES Act. So a lot of different things going on in the CARES Act. I'm gonna to touch upon the ones that you need to think of before the end of the year. So the first one, I made an entire video on this, and that is on the CRD distributions, the coronavirus-related distributions. And that is if you were affected by the coronavirus, you're able to take out up to $100,000 from your retirement account without having to pay the 10% penalty. I'm not gonna go through all the details in this video, but go back and check out that video if you want to know more about that. But you have until the end of the year to decide to do that. Another thing that was part of the CARES Act is the waiver of required minimum distributions for 2020. So if you typically have to take an RMD from your retirement accounts, this year it is waived. So that might not affect you, it might affect your parents because that is for people who are 72 or older, but also if you have an inherited IRA. So if you have an IRA that was left to you and you have to take a distribution from it each and every year, that is also waived for 2020. Another thing that was a result of the CARES Act were the stimulus checks that happened earlier this year. So depending on your income, it was $1,200 per adult and $500 per child that you would get in a stimulus check. One thing to look out for is if you did not qualify because your income was too high, but now in 2020, you didn't have as much income, maybe you qualify now. And if that is the case, then you will actually get that stimulus in the form of a rebate through your tax return when you file your tax return. All right, and then the last point with the CARES Act. Now this still falls under number one, and then we'll start getting moving through the other ones, but there was a lot with the CARES Act this year. So what they did was they are allowing an above the line deduction for charitable contributions up to $300. So it doesn't matter if you're an individual or if you're filing, you know, married filing jointly, it's $300 is the amount of the deduction, but it's an above the line deduction. So that means that you're able to take that deduction even if you do not itemize your deductions on your tax return. So if you take the standard deduction, this is an easy one. Stroke a check to your favorite charity for 300 bucks, you get a tax deduction for it this year. All right, so number two is Roth conversions. So I touched on it a little bit earlier. It depends on your own situation. It depends on your tax brackets. I did a video, the complete guide to Roth conversions. But if you're in a low tax bracket this year, it presents an opportunity to do a conversion and you have to get it done by the end of the year. And the strategy behind Roth conversions is you want to fill up those lower brackets. So if you're in a 12% tax bracket right now and you, have, you still have $20,000 left before you hit the 22% tax bracket, it makes a ton of sense to do Roth conversions 
fill it up and then stop right before you bump yourself into that higher tax bracket. This might take a little bit of planning and a little bit of help from a CPA, but it's definitely worth it and it's a good idea to do. All right, and now number three, and this is only for non-qualified accounts or brokerage accounts, and that's what we call tax loss harvesting. So it is always a good idea as you get towards the end of the year to look through your portfolio and see, do you have a lot of capital gains this year? Did you sell things where you made a lot of money on them and you're going to have a big capital gains bill? Do you have any losses? Do you have any things in there, any stocks in there or funds that lost money? This year, it ended up being a good year for the market. So you might not have many big losers, but there was a lot of volatility towards the beginning of the year. So maybe you did sell out of some stuff at the lows in March and in April and you have some losses locked in. But you want to have a good idea of what it looks like as we go into the end of the year. And if you have losers that you haven't sold yet, it's a good idea to think about selling those losers and locking in the loss to offset some of the gains. And if you have a loss at the end of the year when it's all said and done that you've locked in, you could deduct up to $3,000 per year off of your income. So if there are losses available, locking them in, getting that tax deduction, it makes a lot of sense. Now you don't wanna let the tax tail wag the dog. So you don't wanna solely base decisions selling different stocks or funds just to get the loss. But in a lot of cases, you might be able to find something that's very similar that you could replace it with. Now there is the wash sale rule that you have to be careful about. You can't sell Apple stock, well, Apple went up a lot this year, but you can't sell you know, an energy stock that got killed this year and then buy it right back again and lock in the loss. And also with capital gains distributions. So if you own a mutual fund, for example, that's had a lot of turnover throughout the year, the manager's in there doing a lot of buy sells, the fund's done very well, there's going to be capital gains inside of that mutual fund where they distribute them out at the end of the year to the shareholders. So you might end up getting a big capital gains tax bill, even though you didn't sell any of the shares throughout the year. For your specific mutual fund, you could go to that fund's website, you could look it up. They're usually publishing information about the estimate of what the capital gains distribution will be around this time of year. So it's good to know those things so you could prepare for it and maybe you could find some losers in there that you could sell to try to offset that gain a little bit. It typically makes a lot of sense to do that unless you're in a very low tax bracket this year. And that brings me into number four, which is understanding your tax brackets, especially when it comes to capital gains. For example, you might be in a 0% capital gains tax bracket. If your taxable income is below a certain level, I believe if you're married filing joint, it's under $80,000 or so. If your taxable income is below that, then you are in a 0% capital gains bracket. So in that case, it actually makes sense to sell some winners and to generate some capital gains as long as you don't bump yourself up over that threshold in that case, then you would actually owe zero on capital gains. So for number four, and these are difficult things, these are tax questions, like you need to have a CPA that's helping you with this kind of stuff, or you need to be all over it and really understand where you fall into these tax brackets. But if you could get 0% capital gains, that is a great thing. And this all ties into number five, which I just mentioned, which is tax bracket management. It's very important to know where you fall in those tax brackets because there's so many different deductions and different things going on depending on your tax brackets. So if you are on the border, if you're in a 12% tax bracket and you are on the border of going into a 22% tax bracket, then doing a traditional IRA might make a ton of sense where you could get the tax deduction. And the great thing about traditional IRAs or IRAs in general, Roth IRAs, health savings accounts, you have until the tax filing deadline in order to make decisions around that. So you could see where you fall at the end of the year and then your accountant could help you when you go to make your, when you go to file your tax return, he could tell you which one is gonna be the best to do. You have until April 15th of 2021 to decide if you wanted to do a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA, if you wanna make those con contributions to a health savings account, if you're eligible. So those decisions can be put off as we get closer to the actual filing deadline. But number five, knowing your tax bracket and the consequences of going above into a certain tax bracket or below and the benefits that you get for being in each one, it's important to know these things. All right, and now number six is to spend the money in your FSA account if you have a flexible spending account through work. Now those accounts, they are use it or lose it. Not to be confused with an HSA, which is a health savings account where the money could be you know, invested and rolled over year after year after year where you don't have to spend it each year. With an FSA, it's use it or lose it. So if you don't use it by the end of the year, that money could be forfeited back to your employer and you don't wanna do that. Now, some employers might offer a couple of different extensions. So you need to make sure and check with your HR department. But the first one is they might allow you to take $500 and roll it over to the next year 
which would be good. The second one is they might have a two and a half month grace period after the end of the year where they'll still allow you to submit receipts to go ahead and spend the money in that FSA account. But you need to call your HR department and find out what the deal is with your employer. And then number seven is if you've already hit your deductible for your medical insurance this year, the strategy is to try to accelerate, try to do whatever you can before the end of the year to fit it in before that deductible resets again in January. So if there's any doctor's visits, if there's any prescription, if there's anything that you could do to get it in during December so that it's covered by your insurance, it's always a good idea. It might not be easy to do, but it's something to at least think about instead of waiting and then in January, you know, you start the clock again where you're at zero and you got to hit that deductible again before your insurance really starts to kick in. And then number eight is to do a year end snapshot. I've been doing this for as long as I can remember. Pen and paper, you know, I have a binder of them going back, I think, till the year, the year before I got married, like 2002, where I just write out my net worth statement. So I take an end of the year snapshot. I write all my assets down, the values and my 401ks, my IRAs, how much I think my house is worth, all that stuff, and then all of my liabilities. And I come to my net worth. I actually did a video on how to calculate your net worth, you know, a little over a year ago now, but I'll put a link down below to that. But I handwrite it. I have a binder of them. I could go through and I could see how it's changed throughout the years. It's just a good idea to track and see what your progress is year in and year out. I'm sure now you could do it on the spreadsheet or something, you know, that's a little bit easier, but I like my old school little binder of just writing it all out. All right, everyone, that is it for this one. I hope that you found that helpful. Please subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. Go over, check out schoolofpersonalfinance.com. Make sure to download that end of year planning checklist that I have right on the homepage for you. I've been updating the website a lot over the last few weeks. I'd love to hear what you think. You can always shoot me an email, rich at schoolofpersonalfinance.com if you'd like to talk more about anything. I will see you again next week. Thanks.